Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is John Cameron, and uh, I'm your moderator for the evening. Uh, you're normally used to seeing Richard Fields here. He's way taller, and he sort of has a little bit more hair, but not nearly as good looking. And I, uh, for a living, I work for Pacific Legal Foundation as a development officer, which is a euphemism for fundraiser, because if we put fundraiser on our cards, no one would ever talk to us. And what I do is I raise money so that our wonderful, wonderful lawyers can defend the Constitution of the United States, um, suing government, government entities, uh, regulatory agencies, free of charge um, for our clients who are being trod under the boot of the state. And uh, I want to introduce my guests. I'm going to ask first Gerald to tell you a little bit about himself. Go ahead. My name is Gerald Clift. I'm an attorney. I uh, do computer programming, and I'm a liberty activist. And Brett? And I'm Brett Owens. I'm a co-founder of a software company called Lead Dino, where we make marketing uh, products that help small businesses. Cool. And then a um, little bit different tonight, where we're all going to tell you a little bit about uh, our three listeners that are out there in the live TV land, maybe six tonight. Uh, it's an exciting show. A little bit about how we got into the liberty movement, what, what uh, got us here and what keeps us here. And um, Brett, do you want to start out and tell people why uh, you were drawn to the liberty movement? Sure. Well, I went through the uh, normal progression of looking at both uh, parties. I like the alleged fiscal conservative, conservatism of the Republicans. I like the, the social liberalism of the Democrats. Realized I was what there was already term for a classic liberal, basically a libertarian, someone who believes in um, a conservative fiscal policy, social liberal policy, basically do whatever the heck you want, just don't bother anyone else, and uh, get uh, left alone so you can you can do your own thing. So that's how I was drawn to uh, Leave libertarianism. Leave me alone. Yeah, I like that idea. Gerald? Uh, similarly, I was disillusioned by the two parties. I felt really passionately about um, the idea that you should be able to make decisions that might be bad for you, but they're your decisions. And I uh, started seeing these debates of this uh, Congressman Ron Paul, and I thought, you know, this guy he knows what he's talking about. And I started getting more involved. I, um, I tried, went out to help him on uh, several occasions, I even went to Iowa uh, in 08, or excuse me, 07. And uh, just tried to, and continue to try to help liberty cause as much as I can. Well, and I, and I came to uh, libertarian thought really through objectivism. Um, I read uh, some Ayn Rand, I think, when I was 15 or 16, and and it seemed to me that um, libertarianism, the liberty movement, objectivism, really mirrored nature, which the the uh, far left has co-opted as uh, through the ecology movement as a means to try to turn this country into a socialist state. And um, the, you know, the nature um, punishes bad decisions, rewards good one, um, rewards effort, punishes sloth, and, and fierce competition leads to um, a stronger, more vibrant pack or tribe or whatever. And it just seems so logical to me that that uh, the, the um, lessons of nature um, should be lessons of how we should be not governed. And so that's, that's really how I came to it. So I think uh, I'll probably beat that to death a little bit there. And then our first subject for the evening is, uh, is, is uh, kind of scary. Um, the Justice Department is asking for data on Trump protesters. Uh, Gerald, would you like to open discussion on that? Yeah, so this is a abhorrent warrant that the uh, Justice Department is trying to serve on a uh, company. I forget their name. I want to say their dream host. Dream host. Dream host. Thank you. Okay. And uh, basically, you know, a, a group of people, uh, citizens concerned for their country, regardless of how you might feel about them politically, uh, they wanted to protest Trump. So they went to this website that uh, DreamHost hosted and basically tried to organize and messages to each other. And now the Justice Department is asking for, uh, it's about 1.3 million IP addresses from all of these people that just visited this site. So they weren't even necessarily at the protest, but visited, uh, sent emails to the website's organizers, and they want all the information on people they can get. They, they've specifically asked for addresses. They, like I said, they want the IP addresses, they want their names, they want the 
They want draft blog posts. They want blog posts that weren't public. They just want everything they can get. So uh, the attorneys for DreamHost are, among other things, saying that this violates the Fourth Amendment, that it's not uh, particular enough. You can't just say, I want everything that this um, website ever had without uh, being uh, very specific about what you need. And uh, But <coughs> taking a step back, it's more, more concerning to think about is just a chilling effect on free speech. I mean, the right to protest is foundational to our country. The whole idea, it's the First Amendment. We were allowed to peaceably assemble. And to go after people that weren't even there just because you visited a website, it not only does it seem insane to me, but I, I think it's uh, very concerning for, for the future and um, a bad sign of um, this happening so early in the presidency. Question. So w what is the motivation? Was it because uh, some of the people who went to DreamHost was fomenting rebellion? or some of the people that went there performed violent acts, or what was their motivation for, for this kind of uh, blanket approach to identifying a couple miscreants? Yeah, they're claiming that some people at these protests um, were being vandals, uh, being violent, but this blanket order, mm -hmm. I, I, t to me, it, it goes way past the line of what's Reasonable. Smacks of police state to it's me. It's very much smacks. So of police I mean, states. if if some people at this uh, rally were being vandals, wouldn't uh, eyewitnesses uh, and uh, security cameras be able to identify those people rather than saying, "Give me 1.3 million IP addresses plus all their blogs and everything else"? I mean, yeah. isn't that normal uh, police procedure? If uh, let's say there's a uh, an assault in the city of Sacramento, you don't go to um, all the hosting companies in the world and Comcast and AT&T that handles the traffic and say there was an assault in, on Q Street. I want everything that everybody in Sacramento has talked about on the web so that I can identify those people. That's insane. Yeah, it'd basically be like going after Facebook and saying, you know, that, that assault well, in I Sacramento. Th I, I think you should go after Facebook, but <laughs> for a whole different reason. Just find, find, we're just going to hope we're going to find one private message where someone messaged someone else and said, yeah, I assaulted that guy. I mean, it's, uh, it's a ridiculous concept. It's a scary and, ask on the bright side. Good for DreamHost. So used to tech companies just rolling over like dogs anytime the government asks yeah, them yeah. for uh, like, data. Like Google. And, well, it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, DreamHost does charge for their product. We're actually a DreamHost customer and now even prouder to be one. <laughs> Uh, I, might, I might move my. They're they're a hosting organization. Uh, a hosting might, company. Yeah. I might move yeah. my. I know we're 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 not talking about dollars and cents here, so I think we can talk about them. Uh, so DreamHost uh, supports the Constitution of the United States. Huh? That's something to know, folks. Remember? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So good good for them. They've been standing tall, and uh, they also have a very good hosting service. So you won't be you won't regret it. <laughs> hmm. That almost sounds like a paid commercial endorsement, <laughs> but uh, all right. So the the next subject for the evening, I think, um, I'd like to talk about is a program to identify and uh, mentor slash pay with private charity criminals committing gun crimes to rehabilitate right here in the city of Trees, Sacramento, California. Gerald, do you want to talk about that one again? Yeah, so this was an interesting Sacramento Bee article um, about this uh, pr program. I think it's called Advanced Peace. They've been doing it in Richmond for a few years, about um, I think since 2010. And what they do is they target people that they believe are going to commit gun crime. So specifically in Sacramento, they've done um, a study within Sacramento the city has mm -hmm. that found that these 50 people are the people most likely to commit gun crimes here. So they want to target those 50 people with uh, mentoring, uh, job placement, and um, even uh, payment as much as $9,000 a year. So that's where it gets kind of murky. People are like, well, you're paying criminals, but the, you're paying potential criminals. Some of them are, are known criminals that Current have com committed criminals. crimes, and that's how they've identified that. Well, these people so are. So use the a gun, get nine thousand dollars, kind of. Well, thing. they have to hit certain benchmarks along the way, and what's the the uh, stickler is that they have to pay be paid out of private charities, not through government. So huh. the program itself is a million dollars for all the men mentoring and the job placement and trying to get them um, rehabilitated. But the uh, p actual payment, direct dollars to them, would only come from private charity. But what's so good about it is that this has been done in Richmond and it's already proved to work. They had a 57% reduction in uh, gun, gun, homi gun homicides for gangs after implementing this program. And 
it's much more effective than just you know some random gun control proposal saying, well, the gun's the problem. It's if you want to commit a crime, you're going to find a way. So we have to get at the underlying intent. And that seems to be what they did in Richmond and what they're trying to do in Sacramento now. Cool. Okay. So I'm, you know, I just did some numbers. If you're saying this program costs a million bucks, there's 50 people in it, it's $20,000. That seems like a lot of money. But if, if those people actually do a gun crime, then you have uh, hospital costs of the victim, the incarceration costs, the police, policing costs, the court costs, the, the prison guard, I'm sorry, correction officers, um, salary and all the rest of that. I think that $20,000 would probably be, and I think a, a tenth of, of, of the real cost if they did commit a crime, maybe even a hundredth. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah. just the incarceration cost alone, I think is uh, 70 grand a year per inmate. Mm -hmm. A lot of money. <laughs> well, I could I could incarcerate myself pretty nicely for seventy thousand dollars a year. There must be some layers of bureaucracy there, folks. <laughs> All right. So, um, did, so this is it's worked in Richmond, and now they're trying it in Sacramento. And is the program uh, has the program been running long enough for them to see some results? Or yes, yeah, so about seven years in Richmond. Um, so they're saying, you know what, it seems you're working here, let's try it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Now the pitch is to the city council, let's try to do this program here. And there's uh, mixed support, you know, some city council members are interested. Mm -hmm. I think the incoming police chief has uh, said he's open to the idea and wants to research more. But then in Sacramento? In Sacramento, yes. Okay. And then, uh, but I, I believe the sheriff is opposed to it. And yeah. I, I get the argument. The concern is like, hey, we're rewarding these people for being criminals. Mm -hmm. but if your intent is truly to reduce homicides, there's this pilot program seems working very well in Richmond, which does not, which which has a bad homicide problem. Oh, Richmond's got quite the rep. Yeah. 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 So if it works there, and, it, and we could get it to work here, you know, if we try it out, maybe this is something we could implement more throughout oh. the country and actually work on a method that reduces crime and specifically homicides, rather than like I said, just point the finger at guns. I mean, this the whole the whole gun argument is. It's ridiculous. If you look at the uh, United Nations data, for example, mm. on uh, guns and homicides, and um, you look at the United States, if you if you look at the non-gun homicide rate, so you're not counting guns, you know, your baseball bat, strangle, all, baseball all bat, knives, <laughs> every, everything else, that ho homicide rate is lower than almost, excuse me, higher. Apologize. The homicide, the non-gun homicide rate is higher than almost every nation in Europe when you count their gun homicides and the regular homicides. That's just our non-gun homicide rate. So we have a violence problem here that's not I mean, being addressed. In the U.S., our non-gun homicide rate is higher than um, other countries' total homicide rate. Yeah, and almost every country in Europe. I'm talking England, Germany. And those and are, gu are basically gun-free zones. Yeah, so it's not yeah. the guns is the problem. We have a violence problem here. And I think it's largely due with our incarceration rate. You know, we have the highest incarceration rate in the world and so per capita, but also the most total. We have a... 25% of the world's prison population, but we're only 5% of the population. So and, if you, and if there's some statistics I'd like to throw out, um, talk about these crimes hurting. Uh, if you're a young black man, I think you have uh, in your lifetime a one in six chance of going to prison. That's, uh, and, and the other thing is that, that if you go to prison, it's a felony or else you wouldn't be in prison. So uh, you lose the right to vote, at mm -hmm. least temporarily. You can't own a gun to protect yourself. There are many, and this is forever more. It's not, you know, you, you do your time, you've served your time, and then you get a clean slate. Uh, you can't enter into many professions. Um, I don't think you can ever even be a contractor. Um, so your, your economic choices are, are limited. So you're really almost forced to maintain that cycle of crime. So a lot of people are punished by it. And we basically throw them into a training camp to learn how to be better criminals. That's the worst training part about it. Training camp, training camp for crime. Yeah. 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 The alternative approaches seem uh, promising. It couldn't be worse from certain uh, perspectives. Mm -hmm. Baltimore also is working on a uh, type of alternative uh, approach where they've got ex-gangsters that they. Uh, that they have working on their side and and they're trying to do something similar where they're getting close to 
uh, kind of the, the gang leaders and such. And, and again, promising early results there. Small budget, modest, mm -hmm. I think 1.6 million is what they're working mm -hmm. with. Now, is that um, public money or private money? That is public money. Okay. Yeah, All that's right. from the Baltimore people. Well, I, there, there are successful examples of, um, we talked about, um, you go to prison, uh, really it's a school for crime. And uh, I, in, in my travels, I think it was like 13 years ago, 12, 10 years ago, I was in line to get on an airplane. I, I started chatting with somebody just in case they, their organization needed training because I was working in training. And the guy said he's, a, he's a, a warden for a private prison in Florida, I think. And he, uh, we were talking about the, the evils of you know, public prisons, especially in California. He said, yeah, I, I got a pretty good program going. Um, I, my recidivism rate is like a, about a third of what it is from standard prison population. I said, whoa, how are you doing that? He said, well, you know, prisons, um, you know, it's the whole idea of corrections is that, that people should learn new behaviors so that they can go out and become productive citizens. And so in the past, what we did was just train people. We gave them a trade. And then we discovered that the recidivism rate was exactly the same with a trade or without. So what we did was we looked at the overall problem, and some very smart people said, well, the problem is that these people don't have a couple of skills. And one is uh, uh, taking ownership for their actions. And another one is understanding how to deal with authority figures. So they trained people in those two skills for months, and then only after they were sterling examples of owning their own behaviors and activities and effectively dealing with authority figures, then they put them in the trade program. Mm -hmm. And the combination of those, turning people into adults first and then showing them how to play with toys second, re reduced the recidivism rate tremendously. So there are some working things out there. They're just not... Uh, ever implemented in the state of California. So, um, and Brett um, is going to talk about something very interesting. An unlawful supervised injection site running in the U.S. with posit positive results. Brett, you want to tee that one up? Sure, yes. I believe this is, this is down in Southern California. Well, that's so, an undisclosed location. Undisclosed location yeah. where... Because it'd be uh, shut down. Yeah. Sure. Because yeah, it works. works. Yeah. Right, where yeah. drug users can... Uh, walk into the facility and get their uh, dosage of whatever mm. uh, they're doing. Uh, it's supervised, and then they uh, go about their uh, uh, rest of their day from there. Mm -hmm. And it uh, makes a lot of sense from a safety uh, standpoint. I know that probably one of the most insightful things I've ever read on substance abuse is by narcotics expert uh, Keith Richards, where mm. he said, hey, when people get into trouble with drugs is when they keep trying to up the dosage, up the doses, and then they overdose, and then, and then they're done. This, this guy named Keith, does he have a little bit of experience with that? He's thing? got a little bit of experience, maybe four or five decades worth of experience yeah. with drugs, yeah. uh, still going despite uh, whatever any doctor would uh, say. And he said, you just, you just keep it the same, keep it the same. Yeah. And uh, at least that's worked for him, uh, but it seems to be working very well at this uh, uh, injection site as well in terms of uh, uh, do you know, safety Do you know standpoint. if Mr. Richards has ever overdosed? Has he ever, uh, that you're aware of? Has he ever been in the emergency room for his use of recreational I, pharmaceuticals? I believe he's overdosed. I think that's how mm -hmm. he, he knows he's gotten yeah. into some So here control, we have, yeah. we have I, I think, I don't want to cast dispersions on Keith Richards, but I think it's common knowledge that he's used narcotics for what fifty years or something. Yeah, it's in his autobiography. Yeah, so, and he's yeah. Uh, he's he's I believe he's alive. He looks kind of dead, but I think he's no. He's he he looks like he's got some hard miles on him, but he uh, gets up on stage at age seventy or whatever it is and performs uh, a rather grueling um, profession. And uh, it's because he's, in essence, because of his wealth, been able to do something properly, if you call that properly, that other people haven't been able to. So he's actually a, an example of what this kind of program, he's been in his own private version of that, could do. So what, yeah, let's just talk about the downside. Is there any, can you see any downside to taking uh, people who have a, a problem that leads to you know, theft and burglary and fraud and prostitution and all the rest to pay for their habit 
and then taking away the incentive to do any of those things and simply providing them with their fix. Is there a downside to this that I'm missing? Well, I think the downside would be, or the perception would be that you're enabling mm. uh, the behavior by providing this mm. service. That would be the, the perception. I think it goes back to the legalization of drugs argument. If you, if you legalize and, and you lower prices or you enable people, do you, do you increase usage or are people just going to do what they're going to do? Mm. So what's the, one of you, and I forget which one, threw out some numbers, was it about Portugal? Yes. And, and the, the, if, if I'm correct, you're saying that the actual, when they legalized everything and the drug usage rate dropped, do you know anything about the, the victimless and, and victimized crime rates in the country paralleling that? Did they also drop or, or was that data not available? I, I, I don't know specific to Portugal, but I know um, the United Kingdom did a study that found that I think the average heroin user did almost $100,000 worth of damage when you know, vehicle theft, breaking into cars, robbing stores, but they could just pay about a 10000 to give them all the heroin they could possibly use for a year. And I think they actually... That's uh, 100000 a year they yes, did? Now, yes. is that pounds? Because that's, that's at $1.3. <laughs> I, I believe that's dollars. dollars um, right. well, it's still, that's a chunk of change. Yeah, so they, yeah. they actually took it a step further to, you know, public would pay for it. What's uh, unique about this is that it's just flying under the radar entirely private mm -hmm. uh, expenditures. You know, the government's obviously not paying for it. So who's administering the drugs? Are these, uh, are these qualified medical people or are they volunteers? Or you know, that's yeah. the thing. It's, it's undisclosed, not a lot of information ab about yeah. it, but yeah. um, I read the article in The, the Guardian, and they, it appears to be working. They, there was a, it's only serving about 100 people, but they've had yeah. thousands of injections for these 100 people, yeah. and I two know. people have overdosed on site, and because they were there, they were able to save their lives yeah. with the anti-overdose Because they drug. could give them an uh, 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 antidote to the poison. Or, I don't even know if it's called an antidote. I think it's probably... Um, uh, not that far from us in the state house here in California, I'm guessing, where all this, uh, that's where all this uh, heroin's being used based upon their, you know, their uh, ability to do logical things. That was an attempt at a joke that kind of flew right <laughs> under the radar. Because they're obviously stone folks. That's what I was trying to bring up. All right, so cool. I mean, that's kind of a, a libertarian, um, libertarian thing happening there. Oh, I just blew the ears off our sound engineer there. Um, I think the last thing that we, uh, that we want to talk about is uh, you know, the, the Trump campaign has talked uh, repeatedly about the massive voter fraud in this country. And there, there are some people that, uh, that think that this voter fraud exists. Uh, my brother and, and that this, this huge conspiracy exists. My brother had probably the most insightful statement about uh, conspiracies that I ever heard, especially government conspiracies, said, John, you've met people that work in the government. Do you think they could keep a secret? So that's, uh, let's throw it open for discussion. Uh, Brett, you want to start off? Uh, despite propaganda the contrary, vote fraud seems to be a pervasive and malignant problem. What to do? Well, I think on the fraud uh, thing, it's more about districting, districting, mm. uh, because it's, it's, it's an electoral system so things are set up uh, where uh, districts are such that if Trump won certain uh, areas he, that would give him a chance to win the election despite not winning the popular vote that in my mind opens it up to voter fraud and I'm not worried as much I guess about a US conspiracy as I am about uh, I, the possibility of did Russians hack and all they need to do is fudge some numbers in certain districts and they can do that uh, doesn't seem like that's been adequately looked at in the terms Russians of whether did they it, did mess with it. Yeah. Uh, on one hand, hard to believe that that could happen. On the other hand, when you think about uh, who, who we might have working on our <laughs> computer security at the national level, maybe it's it, it's believable there. So um, I think it's something that probably hasn't been looked at as much as as it should have, and uh, could probably easily be looked at by some impartial computer scientists, professors, if you can find them, uh, to look at it and see was this, does this fit with what you would expect to be the voter distribution, or are we off here, 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 and yeah. here? Well, I'm, I'm going to throw out just kind of a wild conspiracy theory here. Um, there, if you overlap the, the voting, the red-blue state map 
over the map of Democrat or over the map of which states require voter ID, which compared to which don't, there's almost a perfect match. So in the states that don't require uh, people to uh, identify themselves uh, before they can vote, they vote for Hillary Clinton. In the, the states that uh, require voter ID, they voted for Donald Trump. And that's a very strange correlation just to kind of happen. Um, and then kind of on a closing note on that, um, the Gallup poll, which is the probably the most accurate polling organization the world has ever seen, they really kind of uh, designed the science around polling and were the model for it, predicted a victory by the Republican candidate in the first Obama election by um, about 2.7 million votes. And that 2.7 million vote number, the election went the other way, by, by the way, if you've been living in a cave, Obama won. Um, and that 2.7 um, vote differential is what a lot of people are throwing around as the number for voter fraud in the country. So um, is there any reason why we shouldn't uh, require people to show some ID when they do the most important decision they do in their lives every four years? I, I think so. I think the uh, voter fraud is uh, highly exaggerated. I mean, yeah. there's a great reason article about um, yeah. how basically it's, 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 it's not occurring. You're talking about maybe um, a couple dozen uh, yeah. here and there, but specifically on why we shouldn't include it, you we're giving the government too much power to prevent for someone from voting. We already saw that in Florida, where some, many people who are eligible to vote were turned away. And um, you I, mean by requiring voter ID? Yeah, and, and I think I think when you give bureaucrats that power to prevent you from exercising a right prior before it's even counted, you get situations like Martin Luther King, where he wanted to consult a weapons permit and was denied mm -hmm. because a government bureaucrat said, "No, I'm deciding you can't." So you're giving a government bureaucrat the power to say you're not this person, even if you are. And I think um, history has shown that that power will be abused in mm -hmm. the United States. Well, I'm going to I'm going to take a different tact. It doesn't sound libertarian. Uh, on the face of it to require people to uh, identify themselves before they vote. But we require ID in this country to buy liquor. We require ID to uh, um, be presented on demand if you're driving your car somewhere. And, and the, this, this vote that we cast um, affects the future of ourselves and our children for generations to come in some cases because the president is the one that selects Supreme Court candidates who have more control over our lives than probably the president themselves. And I had the last word, which is kind of cool. And I think it's about time. Thank you very much. You've been wonderful guests, not only for this uh, live show, but when you see the recorded shows in the future, you're going to be amazed at their brilliance and depth of knowledge. My name is John Cameron, um, signing off for Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful evening.